Hello, all you groovy cats. Uh, <laughs> this is episode 31. Today we're talking with Eric England, the writer and director of Contracted So. She looked in the mirror, and I don't know why, but she said his name the last time. Candyman. She turned out the lights. <laughs> Welcome to the Indie Film Academy Podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Buff. We're going to continue with our October Shockathon with Eric England from the movie Contracted. He is the writer and director, and he t- takes us through his journey as a filmmaker, how he started out making low-budget films, and slowly built up from there. And I think it's really important for you know first time, second time, whatever filmmakers to understand that there is a you know not for everybody, but the majority of people out there who are making films start out small. They make a, a you know a movie for a couple thousand bucks, or possibly even less, and then slowly, gradually move up. After proving themselves with a small feature, then they move up to a slightly larger one. Your first feature shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be looking for a movie star and trying to spend, you know, a bunch of money and everything. It really should be just like a test. And if for whatever reason it loses money or it becomes a disaster, you can just learn from that and you haven't burned all those bridges and you haven't, you know, wasted a bunch of people's money because that's a lot of money. That's a house right there. You know what I'm saying? Um, Okay, so, and and another thing that you also need to understand is how to sell your film. And that's what I want to talk about for just a second. We are in the final stretch here. We have one month left until we start the Indie Film Academy Masterclass on film sales. Now, I've already done a lot of the interviews, and I can tell you I have learned so much about, you know, and things that I didn't understand before, talking with sales agents, talking with people in marketing and talking about how films actually get sold and how people are making money. And that, that's really the, the core of the whole thing is how you can make money with your film and how you can build a career as a filmmaker. So if you haven't already signed up, please sign up quickly because we only have a certain amount of um, free passes we can give. Uh, go to ifamasters.com and just sign up. If you, for whatever reason you can't go, okay, you know, it's, it's like... Some people are busy those days, but just sign up and we will send you a bunch of information and things, you know, and I'll, I'll send out a bunch of extras and who knows, maybe we'll even have like a, uh, extra day or something. I'm not sure how we're going to completely do it, but it's absolutely essential that you as a filmmaker know how to sell your film. And I talked to, I think it's about 15 different experts who can tell you exactly what you need to have in your film, what mistakes not to make, how to connect with an audience, how to, you know, I'll give you an example of something that's really important, is knowing if you actually need a distribution company for getting on Netflix and getting on iTunes and all these other places, because there's a lot of people that claim to be distribution companies, and they'll come to you and say, hey, I'll get your movie on Netflix. You can go to a um, a company like... Uh, um, distributor or whatever, an aggregator, and get your movie on those platforms. It, you don't have to go through a distribution company. The reason why a lot of company, you know, people should go to uh, a sales agent is because you want international distribution, and you at least want to try that out and see what kind of deal you get. But the main thing is you want to connect with an audience before your film is ever released. You want to start before you ever start making your film, get your Facebook page, get your website, get your Twitter, get you know Instagram, get all of the people in your film to start promoting. And, and that is going to be your key for building an audience. Anyway, that is what we're going to go into with the IFA Summit. So go to ifamasters.com and sign up. And um, a couple of days before that, it starts on November 17th, completely free as long as you get a free pass. And those are running out, like I'm saying. Um, and check that out. Okay, let's move on to our interview. Um, I'm really excited that Eric came on the show. He's a young filmmaker and is really out there doing what a lot of us want to be doing. So he has a lot of great advice about how you can become a successful filmmaker. Here we go. Are you trying to get me drunk? Yes. Are you here with anyone? No, I'm not. Are you seeing anyone? I am. He's a lucky guy. Girl. Why isn't she here with you tonight? We should stop, please. 
slept in pretty late this morning. Oh. Feeling okay? Don't even start with that. What seems to be the problem? What the hell is wrong with your eye? Are you sexually active? Are you using protection? This appears to be some sort of sexually transmitted disease. There's something wrong with me. with anyone until we can determine what it is we're dealing with. Okay, well, I mean, I guess the first thing that I want, I usually start out with is just really talking about your background, where are you from, how did you get into filmmaking and all that. So could you give us just kind of a, a little bit of background about you? Yeah, totally. Um, I'm originally from Russellville, Arkansas, which is, uh, you know, a really small town um, in between like Fayetteville and Little Rock uh, in Arkansas, right smack dab in the middle of the Bible Belt. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of originally getting into filmmaking, there was no, um, you know, really, there really was no introduction to film other than, you know, my, my dad was a big movie nut. And a lot of my family members continue to be, uh, you know, big film fans. Like I, I was exposed to a lot of, um, you know, especially genre movies when I was younger. Um, my, my grandmother actually, for some reason, my grandparents have a really big thing with Stephen King. Like Stephen King novels were always big <laughs> in my house. Right. So Stephen King movies were really big in my house. And that, that just kind of, you know, opened the door. It's kind of a gateway drug into other <laughs> horror movies. Like I remember the first really four or five movies I, I can remember seeing when I was a kid were like uh, Stephen King's It, the original Night of the Living Dead, um, Fright Night, Lost Boys, like a, a lot of vampire movies near dark. I think my dad was a big vampire fan. Uh, fan. Mm -hmm. um, but my dad was 21 when he had me and my mom was 18. So they were kind of kids raising a kid. Right. Um, and and so yeah, that kind of kind of allowed me to be exposed to to things I probably shouldn't have been at that age, but kind of you know created this uh, love for the darker side of storytelling that just kind of stuck with me all through you know my adolescence and growing up, and I, I became like an avid movie watcher. My my dad and I, you know, our quality time was always spent like we had movie night every week. So um, you know that that kind of really started it. And then when I when I got uh, ready to graduate high school and, and get ready to decide what I wanted to do with my life. I was like, you know, I, I, I knew I couldn't, I, I was a horrible student in school. I want to say horrible, but I was just one of those students where if I, if I didn't feel challenged, I just didn't pay attention, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so essentially I knew like if I didn't do something that I wasn't, you know, diehard passionate about, um, I, I, I wasn't going to have a very happy life. So I decided to kind of, you know, take the leap of faith and I moved to LA when I was 19. Wow. Okay. So what what was that like when you arrived? Was it kind of you know what what was what it was versus what your expectation was? Because um, it's very young to just pick up and move. I mean, nineteen. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd never set foot on an airplane. Like it was it was a big culture shock at first, um, and it took a while to kind of get acclimated. I mean, I I definitely went through you know a couple years of missing home and and uh, or not necessarily missing home, but just you know not feeling like I didn't fit in, um, right. especially, which is weird because LA is kind of a, a melting pot of cultures and personalities and things like that. So, you know, I think that was really just my own insecurities because every, everyone kind of fits in out here, you know, everyone's different. So, um, but essentially, um, you know, it, it, it just took a while. Like it was exciting because every day when I woke up, I could feel like, okay, opportunity was within grasp, you know, like it, when you mm -hmm. first move to LA, you kind of feel like, okay, there's so much happening around you. How do I get involved? And I, I think that was kind of the daunting part was how do I get involved? You know, it's like, I knew it was happening. I knew there, you know, it's like I, I could go to restaurants and see people that I admired and I could go grab drinks with filmmakers that I loved. And, you know, sometimes I saw actors and stuff that I wanted to work with, but 
you know, I was like, how, how do I find legitimacy and, and approach these people? Because, you know, the worst part was I, I moved out here to go to school. So, you know, it, you're almost worse off being a film student than just a filmmaker, you know. So <laughs> um, so it was like I, I was I was below a filmmaker as a film student at the time. So, you know, but but at the same time, you kind of can use that to your advantage. You know, it's like being a film student shows that, you, you know, you're, you're pursuing it in some some regard. So some people, you know, will, will lend you a helping hand, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I just started trying to network and, you know, really pound the pavement as, as hard as I could and, and get get, you know, find my way in as much as possible. But yeah, every day was just waking up and figuring out how to how to climb the wall, so to speak, and get inside. Right. So when you first got there, were, you said you were, were you going to school or were you just trying to get a, a, a job doing like a PA or doing whatever? Uh, when I first moved here, I was, I was going to school. So, um, so okay. yeah, I, I moved here in like June of 2007 and, uh, and I started school in July. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really quick transition. I, I, I think I was here for maybe three weeks just to kind of get acclimated and, um, just kind of learn, you know, the, the routes and how to drive and, and all that stuff. So, um, you know, I had a little time to kind of pound the pavement. Uh, you know, I wasn't looking for a job immediately cause I was getting ready to go to school full time, but yeah, it, it was, it was mainly for education first. Where, where did you go to school? I went to the LA film school in Hollywood. Oh, ah, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So t- talk about that a little bit going to, uh, what, what were some of the key things that you learned in film school that have helped out and, and maybe some of the things that you learn in film school that didn't really have anything to do with actually working in the film industry. You know, I, I'd say it's more of the latter, to be honest with you. I film, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a very big advocate of film school, and, and that's not to knock film school at all. I just think, um, you know, the the film business, especially when I was going to school, it was changing so rapidly. I mean, I, I went to film school in 2007, 2008. Um, and we were still learning on film, and we were probably one of the last, you know, classes to to really focus on film. Um, and, and when we weren't shooting on film, we were shooting on, on mini DV. So like we weren't even really being, you know, HD was something that was reserved for like higher level classes and things like that, you know? So Uh it, it, it was kind of a weird space because it's like HD was this holy grail of new technology yet we were still shooting on film, you know, and it's like, it, it was, it was bizarre. So it, the teachers were still trying to learn things. Um, you know, some of my teachers were, uh, film students that had graduated a few years before us who needed jobs. So they came back to work at the school, you know, my directing teachers, um, you know, had agents and they were trying to get jobs. So they would have to step out of class and take phone calls and, you know, it was just a really more than anything. I would say the best thing about film school was it exposed me to Hollywood and, and I, I tend to have a very objective personality. Um, I, I never really take things for how they're presented to me. I, I kind of analyze them. Um, and, and so I think because of that, I, I didn't buy everything that I was told right away. And I think that was a good thing because, you know, essentially I learned really quickly that a lot of my film teachers, uh, you know, were, were teaching us ways they would do things. And I think that's the worst way to teach film. Like, Film uh, or, or art in general. It's like if you're a teacher, you should be nurturing the instinctive creativity that your student has and not telling them how they should do something, but guiding them to find their own voice. And so I remember shooting, um, you know, film projects in film school and almost every single thing like we, we had to use the same sets, we had to use the same cameras and all that jazz. And so many of those short films ended up looking almost identical. And it was because, like, the teacher was like, oh, you should do this shot or you should do this or you should use a dolly or, you know, and it's like they were just influencing uh, the students in the ways that they would themselves. So, you know, I I immediately kind of tried to buck the system a little bit and do things a little differently. And, um, and, and, you know, it, it kind of pushed me to be my own unique voice. And, and I mean, especially in film school, you know, every, everyone becomes a – uh, uh, you know, a, a genius film critic or, you know, they, every film student gets snobby. So it, it was nice for me because I, I, I learned to get criticism very early um, just because I, I wanted to stand out. So I think that that prepared me a little bit for uh, when I got out of school and started making movies. You're at school, film school now. That, then you graduate. What's your kind of next step after that? Um, my next step was freaking out. Um, (laughs) I basically, when I got out of film school, I was like, shit, what do I do next? Um, you know, the, the cameras that I had, you know, at my disposal were taken away. Um, the, the equipment I had at my disposal was taken away. The collaboration I had with the other film students was taken away. Um, you know, and, and I didn't have, uh, I, I didn't have, you know, the, the money from like school loans and and crap like that, that, that I was, I had. So it was kind of like, 
Um, okay, how, you know, I, now I have to find a job, but I, you know, I, I made a very strict promise to myself and, and I'm kind of stubborn this way, but I was like, you know, I, I didn't want to go work at Starbucks. I didn't want to go work at Blockbuster or something like that. Um, so, you know, I, I was like, if I'm going to live in LA, like I need to be focused on making movies. So what I did was I, uh, I, I went back to my hometown and, uh, for, for a few months and worked at the nuclear power plant there, which is kind of a dangerous job. So it pays you a lot of money really fast. And so I, <laughs> I used that money to come back out to LA and kind of live on for a while while I was trying to make my first movie. Um, you know, so it was nice. It's like, I, I, I was able to kind of make a lot of money really quickly and then, um, you know, move, move back out to LA and, um, essentially pay all my rent and stuff in advance. So I didn't, I didn't really have to worry about a job and I could focus on writing and uh, applying to direct things and, and stuff like that. The, the worst part about that was, you know, I, I was getting rejected day, you know, day in and day out from people cause I didn't really have a great, you know, resume. I only had film student shorts on my, on my reel. And, um, you know, so I, I realized like, okay, I need to, I need to generate my own material. So I wrote tons of scripts. I wrote probably like five screenplays in a year. Um, and, and just started, you know, hustling and trying to meet people. And, and eventually that led me to, you know, meeting some producers and trying to get a movie financed. Um, and it fell through and, and that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me was kind of that, that, um, that ticking clock mentality that I had, which was like, okay, I have enough money to last me X amount of months or a year or whatever. And so it's like, I need to do something in this time. And, uh, by, you know, I graduated in 2008 and by November of 2009, I had written and directed and produced and self-financed and did basically everything on my first feature film, um, which was called The Hostile Encounter. And I used that as kind of like um, just kind of like a, you know, a calling card. Like, hey, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to invest in myself and um, and kind of show people that I can I can, you know, make a film. And Ironically, we never finished that movie. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of put it off to the side because it was my own money. It was my own investment. So I didn't have to repay anyone. Um, but we put it off to the side because I ultimately ended up getting uh, an offer, you know, or a proposition to direct my, my first real feature film, Madison County, which actually got released and, you know, did pretty well. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was all because of Hostile Encounter because I had invested in myself and, and proven that I could make a, make a movie. And, and, you know, one of my buddies was like, Hey, you know, if I could get some, some more money, like, would you want to make something that we could, you know, potentially try to, you know, make something on a bigger scale. And that turned into Madison County. So your friend was more of a producer who was looking for a writer and director in that case. Um, actually he was my, my director of photography on hostile encounters. His name was Daniel Dunn. And, um, oh, okay. we, we had met in film school and, um, at the time, when I directed Hostile Encounter, I was 21 years old, and um, when I made Madison County, I was 22. So, um, so essentially, on on Hostile Encounter, he he graduated film school the same time I did, and he bought a bunch of equipment to kind of you know start renting out and shooting music videos and things like that. And I told him, I said, "Look, I'll be your first client. I'll uh, you know I'll rent your equipment from you. I want to shoot my first movie." And I was like, "You can come shoot it for me." Um, so he said, great. So we had like a five person crew. I, you know, we, we road trip down to Arkansas and we started shooting the movie in Arkansas and worked our way back to California and we shot the opening of the film in California. So we shot the movie in like five different States. It was kind of a road trip movie. And, um, yeah, you know, it, it was, it was just a fun experience. And, and I think it kind of, you know, got the juices flowing for everyone to say, Hey, what, what else can we do? And that excitement is, you know, infectious. Like once you get that bug, you know, it's kind of hard to shake. So Daniel immediately was like, you know, he watched the cut that I edited together with my editor and he was like really astounded by what, what, you know, what the film had become. Because I mean, you know, he was on set every day. We only shot for like five days, but you know, he was like, wow, that, that little road trip that we did in five days with my camera, he's like, you, you turned into like a pretty competent little movie. And he was like, and, and we had nothing. So he was like, you know, if you, if, if I could get like some money, would you want to try and make something a little bigger? And I was like, absolutely. If you can do it, I'll, I'll start right away. And so, um, he knew that I had the screenplay for Madison County cause I'd been talking about it and trying to get it financed and everything. So he was like, what, what about that movie? And I was like, absolutely. So we, we instantly started, uh, working on that and kind of put hostile encounter to the side. So talk to me a little, as much as you can about, um, 
putting together okay first of all hostile encounter what are we talking about in terms of just budget and who who was your crew and how did how did you put all that together i mean even though you're saying it was kind of you know just like you you got in a car and you were driving but there does have to be a certain amount of organizing to that yeah 100 percent. i mean it, it was honestly the, the the simplest organization possible because at the time i knew it was going to be an experiment and that's how i wanted to treat it was an experiment um so the budget total i gave myself five thousand dollars so i said i'm going to spend five thousand dollars on this movie and we only ended up spending thirty five hundred so the the budget was three thousand five hundred and um you know most of that went to paying um Daniel for his equipment and his services and then gas money to drive down to Arkansas and back and then um you know whatever whatever meals I had to feed everyone and things like that so you know so everyone, who was who was your crew was it just uh were you he was shooting it right uh he was shooting it well actually it's a found footage movie kind of so um so the okay. main char- the main character was actually filming himself for a lot of the movie um and so, um, you know, I wrote it around a certain actor who was Ace Marrero, who ended up starring and producing uh, Madison County with us. So um, so my crew was myself, Daniel, um, Nick Bellinger, who was a good friend of mine, um, who helped us produce uh, a, a kind of a Swiss Army knife PA named just uh, Jordan Mears, um, who helped out. And then, um, and then we had a, a wardrobe girl who was my girlfriend at the time, and and her family helped out. My family helped out because we shot in my hometown. So, it like the crew was literally like five people, but you know we I strategically shot it in my hometown, knowing that I could get vehicles for free and houses for free, and you know whatever resources that I needed. So we didn't spend any money on props. We didn't spend any money. Like we went into you know locations and shot for free while people were actually you know eating in the restaurants and things like that. So, it, it, you know, we're able to stretch a dollar. <laughs> was there any thought about, you know, what you were going to do with it? Or was it just purely like, oh, we're just going to do this for fun. We're, not, we're just going to do exactly what we want to and not worry about the commercial side of stuff. I mean, was that well, the idea? I mean, I think at the time, you know, we, we had never sold a movie. So we didn't know what the commercial side was, you know, like okay. uh, we, we, we shot this kind of hoping it was going to be you know, the Blair Witch Project or Paranormal Activity. You know, this this <laughs> right. was actually yeah. before Paranormal Activity even came out, I think. So um, so we were shooting a found footage movie, which was really, really ahead of the curve uh, at the time. So, yeah. you know, we, we kind of just wanted to do um, – just, just experiment and say, okay, let's make a movie. You know, we knew Blair Witch was popular. We knew Paranormal Activity was kind of on the rise, but it hadn't come out yet. And so, um, so we were like, okay, let's go make, you know, our own movie and we'll try and sell it. And it was kind of just like – we knew we needed to make something that was competent, and then once we knew we had something competent, then we could figure out the the what we did right and what we did wrong. Um, so you know, it was a great learning process because I actually ended up once we got a finished cut. Um, you know, I never went into sound design or anything like that, so we never finished the sound on the movie. But um, but I sent the rough cut around to some companies, and you know, it was funny because looking back on it, like I cringe because you know I sent it to some <laughs> some reputable people, and, and it's right. funny. I'm sure some of them I've even inter- interacted with now. Um, but you know, at the time, I was just so excited to say, "Hey, look, I made a movie that I I wanted anyone and everyone to see it, even if they hated it. I just wanted to learn." So it was kind right. of like just you know throwing mud at the wall, seeing what stuck, and so. Um, so yeah, you know, we we weren't real. I mean, the goal was to sell it, but you know, thankfully, I knew that I I had made the investment. So you know, wh- whatever financial responsibility there was, it was all on me. Right. Yeah, and that that's a big thing that we we always stress. You know, um, or you know, when when it comes to making a film, it's good to just get out, and especially with all the cameras that are available now. I mean, it's ridiculous. The people yeah. just get out and, and just start shooting. You know, don't look for making a, a you know a big movie first. Just get out and shoot as much as you possibly can, and don't you know, just make all the mistakes before you you know have everything on the line and have a whole full you know film crew around you and and you know make a bunch of mistakes. Then do all the mistakes, uh, you know, cheaply <laughs> first. You know. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I you know I I came from the school of like. Um, you know, I like Eli Roth was a big inspiration, you know, for when I first started out. And I knew Cabin Fever was made for like a million dollars. And I knew Reservoir Dogs was made for like a million dollars. So like and, and Saw was coming out around, you know, a little before then. And so, you know, I, I kept saying like, all right, I wanted to make my first movie for like a million dollars and do it legitimately and make it the right way. 
But then there was the other side of me that was like, you know, I had read Rebel Without a Crew and Robert Rodriguez. And, and so it was like there was part of me that really wanted to kind of wait for that magic experience of like, oh, I wrote a great script and it attracted some investors. And, you know, next thing you know, I'm, I'm on the set of a legitimate feature film and I'm directing. But I also knew that, you know, no one was going to give me that opportunity. And, and I didn't know if my writing was good enough. I just I just didn't know. So I was like the only thing I knew how to do was do it on my own. So I was like. I, I kind of had no other choice, and I was very stubborn in that regard, and that stubbornness has thankfully carried me a long way. <laughs> yeah, and things have changed a lot, you know, with the, the technology. I mean, it used to be back in, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in a different generation, so, you know, I was making, you know, independent films back in the 90s with, like, these people who were shooting on 16 millimeter and 35 yeah. millimeter, and it was like, I mean, you couldn't do anything for... You know, I mean, you couldn't even think about making a film for, you know, uh, less than a hundred thousand dollars easily, just like yeah. you know, buying the, the, the film stock, you know? Yeah. So, exactly. you know, and nowadays it's just so easy to, to pop a lens, you know, even get a DSLR or something and just get out and shoot, you know? Totally. Yeah. Um, let me, let's move on to, uh, Madison County. Now, what, what was the, can you talk about, um, how that came together and give people just a little bit of an idea of, you know, what kind of budget range you moved up to, how things were different from working on um, the hostile encounter and, and just a little bit of insight into the filmmaking process for that. Totally. I, I had written the script um, based on some ideas I'd had for a while. Um, I, I had actually written it before hostile encounter. I think hostile encounter was actually like my sixth or seventh screenplay that I'd written. And um, Madison County was actually my second in, in the grand scheme of things. So I had had Madison County kind of sitting around, and then when Daniel approached me about it, um, I actually didn't want to do Madison County because I actually wanted a bigger budget. I wanted around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to make it, and um, and we ended up making the film for around like seventy thousand, I think. So I, I had to tailor the script down a little bit. I went through several several rewrites. We, you know, different investors came in at different times before Daniel, so the script had gone through several several um, versions, and you know things had changed and things had come up and gone away. So, you know, it, it was a great experience because I almost went through my own, um, you know, kind of vacuum uh, development process because like I, you know, I, I was from the school or the train of thought of like, okay, I write a script, I go make a movie, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I wasn't really concerned about like development or anything like that. So, you know, when I wrote the script, I was like, great, this is my movie. And, you know, and I was ready to shoot it. And, you know, I, I had some investors approach me and they read the script and they knew nothing about filmmaking, but they, you know, they obviously watched movies. So they were like, oh, I think you should change this or that. And, and you know, so I kind of, you know, I, I, I'm actually really thankful for that process because like, you know, you, you can actually learn a lot from people who watch a lot of movies um, and, and, and aren't necessarily filmmakers because they're, they're going to tell you what bumps, you know, not everyone knows how to read a screenplay. Not everyone knows how to visualize something in their head, but I think each and every person that read the script that potentially was bringing money to the table kind of brought something to the film that it, at least made it better than my initial draft. You know, I'm, I'm still not, you know, super happy with what I wrote on the, on the page, but, um, you know, I was young, so, but it was much better than the first draft. I mean, I'd, I'd probably cry if I read the first draft now. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, so, so Daniel, Daniel said he could get like, um, I want to say like 50 to 70,000 and, um, you know, but, but the idea was, uh, you know, he was like, we, we can't lose this money. This is my, my parents' money. So his parents were car dealers and I think they'd like taken out a loan for us or something like that. And so, um, so essentially what happened was we went and took the first scene of the movie, Ace Marrero, the star and producer of the film, um, or one of the producers, he, he suggested, uh, I, I basically, I wanted to go shoot a scene. I wanted to shoot something just for fun, just to kind of, you know, sharpen my tools because the, the last thing I'd shot since then was Hostile Encounter, which was a found footage movie. So I wanted to kind of prepare myself to shoot a traditional narrative and, and get acclimated again with kind of the camera and stuff like that. So, and that format of storytelling. So Ace actually suggested that we shoot a scene from the movie to kind of use as a promotional tool for the film. And so we went uh, about an hour outside of L.A. and shot uh, a little scene from the movie that was essentially the opening of the film, kind of tailored for that environment. And, um, and we released it online uh, a couple months later, and all of the news sites and blogs picked it up. And um, we actually had uh, foreign distributors contact us based off of the, the trailer. 
And they reached out to us and they said, hey, we really like this. We, we'd like to make you an offer. And so basically people were offering us money for this, you know, for this film that they hadn't even seen yet that actually didn't even exist at this point. Because this was just a fake trailer that we shot or a fake scene that we shot, um, you know, for like less than a hundred dollars. I think it was like 50 bucks we spent on it or something like that, like ninety five dollars. So um, so, you know we use that money as almost like a verbal commitment um, to say, okay, great. Um, we can, um, you know, we, we know we can at least make this much money. Like if these people are the only people to ever buy the movie, then we know we can at least make that much money back. Um, and then, you know, we were just thinking in, in terms of like, you know, punk rock garage band style. We're like, if we have to, we'll, we'll go door to door selling DVDs of this movie ourselves to make the money back. So, we kind of just, you know, reverse engineered it and said, okay, great. This is, you know, as safe as we can make this investment and, um, you know, started casting the movie and away we went. Now, the, the people that were, um, you said foreign distributors were, were interested or? Yeah. Okay. Now, what what sort of things, I mean, first of all, where were they just like overall global foreign distributors or were they like specific to they were, say they were, Europe yeah, or it was like it was like Germany and and I want to say a couple of others actually reached out but I mean uh, it was it wasn't exclusive to foreign like I think a couple of sales agents and maybe a couple of uh, U.S. distributors reached out um, but yeah essentially we just had interest in sales uh, Germany I think Germany and maybe one other country were the only ones to actually offer up like a legitimate number and say hey we'll pay you this much um, before ever even seeing the film. But, um, but yeah, so we, we had interest in specific people who are actually willing to cut a check and then people, um, you know, who are interested in representing the movie and, you know, and, and essentially, you know, it, we got to a point where people were like, Hey, we want to see the whole film. And we we're like, okay, great. We'll call we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you in a few months, you know? Yeah. That's gotta be a good feeling, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was exciting. Now, is that fake trailer still available somewhere? So people uh, can see it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'll, I'll ask you for a link. I'll put that in the uh, show notes because I'd, I'd really be interested to, to just take a look at that. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about the, the process, like the difference between making Madison County versus Hostile Encounter and, and, you know, what like, you know, just details like what kind of camera you guys were using, how you work with actors, what the different. I mean, I assume you're working with like a full on, you know, grip, grip crew and, you know, it was more of a professional like film set, right? Um, I mean, I, you, you'd want to think that, um, but it was actually, <laughs> um, you know, we we essentially had, um, you know, we had like soccer dads as our grip team and stuff like that. You know, we, we shot <laughs> we we shot on the uh, we shot on the red, um, which was a you know a major upgrade from what we shot Hostile Encounter on. So, you know, I was working with a new camera system I was not familiar with, which you know since I was directing wasn't as big of a deal. Um, but you know, I was working with a professional director of photography who had done other things before. Um, you know, so I, I was the youngest person on set essentially, you know, and, and I was probably the most inexperienced and, um, you know, and, and I went from managing a crew of like five people to managing a crew of like 25 people and, and, and a cast of like five to seven or eight people a day, you know? So, it was kind of a kind of a head first, you know, jump into the pool, so to speak, because, you know, I, um, you know, I, I'd never done anything of that size. Like I remember seeing the grip trucks pull up on the first day of, of filming or, or, you know, first first day of pre-production or whatever. And I, I was like, whoa, you know, like this is a uh, this is legit. <laughs> like the, the biggest movie set I had been on. Like is somebody up- making a movie around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like this was the biggest set I'd ever been on. And, and the movie hadn't even started shooting yet. So, right. um, you know, it, it was it was very much an eye opening experience. And, um, you know, it, but I, I looking back on it, I wouldn't have traded it for anything because it, it really prepared me for the do's and don'ts and, you know, kind of forced me to get get my shit together because, you know, I, I was totally, you know, I, I was really prepared. Like I took my job very seriously and I stressed day in, day out. I think, I think by the time we actually start rolling cameras, like I had lost like 70 pounds, but, um, <laughs> but like, you know, it, it was, um, it was, you know, a really serious commitment. I took it really seriously. I was, you know, we, we, we were extremely underprepared and, um, huh? we can't, what? No. 
Um, sorry. <laughs> My girlfriend's walking through and she was like, he can't see me, can he? Um, <laughs> but, um, so, uh, so, you know, it, it was a really big undertaking and, and, you know, I, I was totally unprepared or I was prepared, but I think we as a crew and producers, and I think we were really underprepared in terms of like what we do, what we thought we were getting ourselves into. Like we had tons of locations, tons of actors, tons of moving parts, so it was just a really big undertaking that I think, you know, we, we, we underestimated, but were, you know, thankfully we had that willingness to take on a challenge. And I think that's a lot of what filmmaking is, is just the ignorance to not be told no, you know? Yeah. Well, now looking back, what are some of the things, you know, mistakes that maybe you made early on that you, you know, corrected or, or you know, learned in your next features? I just sent you that promotional trailer, by the way. Okay, perfect. Um, what was that question? Sorry. Well, I mean, what are you, you said? It was a bit overwhelming, and to, you know, uh, you were prepared, but it was still like you know there was somewhat of a learning curve. Can you talk about like for people who might be going into their first big budget or you know um, higher budget than just like a little you know uh, you know backyard kind of film, going up a step from that? What what sort of things they need to do to be prepared for that? What did you do as a director mentally to be able to do that? And what, what sort of things were you doing every day? Um, and looking back, kind of what, what mistakes, what would you have done differently? Well, I mean, you know, to be honest, Madison County was still very much a backyard film. Uh, you know, it, it was <laughs> you just know what back- I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Compared um, to the other one. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I mean, the, what I did mentally was I watched a lot of films, and I think that was ultimately my, my downfall, was um, I, I got locked into a specific vision based on movies that I knew had worked. Um, I, I became really paranoid about uh, how people would perceive my film, so I, I, I didn't want to mess it up, and I think that was, you know, like I said, my biggest downfall. So I watched a lot of movies that had a similar aesthetic, uh, that had used... Um, similar ideas and things like that. So, you know, I, I almost tried to carve and copy those, but do it in my own way. And I, looking back, I wish I would have just done what I wanted um, because, you know, I, I was imitating them in the hopes that I would have success like them, essentially. And, and I think mm-hmm. that was, uh, uh, you know, the wrong choice. Um, but because of that, I was really prepared. Like I, I, you know, I knew exactly how I wanted to shoot it. I knew, you know, I knew how to execute it. I just think the sites I had set my execution at were lower than what they should have been, I guess is the best way to put it. So it's like, I achieved what I set out to do. I just didn't, I didn't set my achievement bar at the right level. Um, and, and so, you know, but to a degree, it's like there was a victory in that because it proved to me that I could do what I set out to do and that I could, I could pull off what I said I could pull off, you know? And, um, so, you know, tons of research, tons of rehearsal, tons of, you know, uh, getting to know my cast and crew and, uh, just, you know, learning to be a leader kind of, uh, by default, you know, it's like, like I said, I'd never been in control of that many people. So I naturally just kind of had to learn how to take the reins. We didn't have a true first AD. So I was running the set, um, you know, and, and I was scheduling the film and, um, you know, everything essentially the responsibilities fell heavily on me being a director, but not only a director, I was also one of the producers. So, you know, we were some young producers that had never made a movie of this size before. So we were all learning as we were filming. So, you know, it's really hard to say what we did right and what we did wrong. Cause we, we were basically just surviving. I felt like the whole time we were kind of like drowning, but keeping our head above water. You know? <laughs> yeah. That, that, that sounds, you know, familiar. I mean, so many other directors that I've talked to have really, you know, the, even at, you know, much higher levels, it's always kind of chaotic, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So talk talk about from what what ended up in, did you end up end up like having the the distribution and things that you were looking for at the end of that did you make the deals I mean t- talk about what happened to the film after you made it uh, yeah so after we made it we like I said we we reached out to a lot of those same people who had reached out to us and we we started cutting a trailer immediately we got very fortunate. Um, and were uh, able to get uh, one of the best trailer editors in Hollywood to kind of cut a trailer for us, uh, you know, as a huge favor to one of the people on our film. So we had a great trailer, and we started shopping it around, and, you know, we, we, we made a lot of first-time mistakes. We showed people the movie way before it was ready. Um, we submitted to festivals that were way out of our league. Um, but ultimately, we got the film into Screen Fest, uh, which is, you know, where Paranormal Activity was discovered, and... Um, 
you know, we had distributors contact us from there and, um, you know, I was able to get a manager, which, which was helpful in terms of getting the film out and about. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of did, took a similar approach to what we did with, um, Hostile Encounter and we just kind of showed it to anyone that was willing to watch it and, uh, you know, tried to learn from it. But the best thing that ever happened was, um, you know, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't use a, a domestic sales rep, uh, to sell the movie because we really wanted to kind of go through that experience on our own and, mm -hmm. and kind of learn to look over our own contracts and see what would happen and see where we would succeed and fail and things like that. So once again, we, we took a very, um, you know, dive in head first type of approach to the whole process. Was there any kind of idea about building it was social media that's still kind of before social media or social um you know building a social like having facebook pages and stuff like that that was kind of before that right um uh, not really i mean it was 2011 so i mean it, it oh, was okay yeah 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 so it was around that time but um you know the the best thing that i think we had to our to our you know availability was Ace Marrero, who, you know, was uh, an actor. So he was used to promoting himself. And, and you know, as a, as a young actor in Hollywood, like, you kind of have to be your biggest um, PR person and biggest cheerleader and champion. So Ace was really taught us to do that for the film. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we had a huge, huge fan base um, for the movie before the movie was even finished. Like, we had people buying T-shirts from us. We had people buying posters. Um, so it, we almost tried to turn it into an event, um, you know, just, Hey, come be part of this experience with us. Like we're learning, like we, we took a very like people's filmmaker mentality because, you know, and, and that's something that I try to continue now is like, I, I, I like for my experiences to be kind of an open book and let people know like, Hey, this is the reality of it. And, and we kind of did that with Madison County because, because we shot in my home state of Arkansas, it was very much a, um, you know, a, a family type of environment and you know we we tried we we were on the local news and we tried to keep everyone involved and and make it just a fun experience for everyone and that kind of translated into the distribution and people talking about it and sharing things so social media was probably one of the biggest advocates we had in our corner okay yeah i mean because that's one of the things we always you know talk about is how to you know this idea that you're going to make your film and go to a film festival and all of a sudden everybody will know about your film. It's like, you know, is, is you're going to run into problems with that because it's, it's much easier to start building up a following as you're making your film and even showing kind of behind the scenes and what's going on so that once your film is done, you've already kind of built up that anticipation. Yeah, 100%. I'm, I'm actually not a massive, massive fan, especially in the genre world of, um, North American film festivals, because um, at least on the like the the top tier side in the, like South by Southwest and and the things like that, because it's such a incestuous and fraternal type mentality. You know, they they bring back a lot of filmmakers, films um, who have had movies there in the past and things like that. So you know, th like Contracted, for instance, uh, you know, Contracted was one of the most successful films of that year, and we didn't play one major festival here in America. You know, and it, it was uh -huh. it, it was because like people didn't know who are who are you know who I was. They didn't know who our stars were and things like that. And it's like festivals used to be about finding and discovering uh, new talent, but now it's really about attracting big stars and bringing back people that they enjoy drinking with at the festival, you know, in previous <laughs> years. So it's not really as much about how good your movie is as much as it is about how well the, the jury or the, you know, the programmers like your movie. So, you know, it, it, they become kind of a gatekeeper in a way. And I, I, I don't like that mentality. So I'm actually a big fan of, you know, using the internet, using the audience. Like I don't, I, I no longer worry about, what festivals will think about my films or what critics will think about my films. Like I, I make movies for audiences now because it's like ultimately those are the people who have to pay to see your movie. And those are the people who are going to keep you in business and keep food on your table. But also those are the people who are going to be with you through, through the thick and thin of it. Like if you support them, they're going to support you. And it's like, I want to give them good material because ultimately no offense, you know, I, there are tons of critics that I love, but it's like critics ultimately see my movies for free. So they're just judging it based on, <laughs> you know, the, the artistic merit and, right. and all that stuff. And that's fine. But you know, at the end of the day, I, I have to make movies and, and continue making movies if, if I want to live. So, you know, my, my job is to, to please the people who are ultimately uh, supporting me, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what is your main way of, you know, connecting with an audience 
on social media? Do you have kind of a, a plan? I mean, are you just like getting on Twitter and Facebook or, or what, what does that, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of it's through Twitter and Facebook and things like that. Like I, I, I'm a big fan of interacting with my audience. Like when Contracted came out, you know, the reviews were extremely polarizing. People either loved the film or they hated it. And it's funny because people who hated the movie still talked about it. And, and because of that, <laughs> the word of mouth was great. And, um, right. You know, so so I would go on Twitter and I would just talk to people who were talking about the movie. And, and some of the biggest supporters I have now are people who ultimately were talking shit about my movie when it first came out, you know, and <laughs> right. and and, you know, and it's fine because like, you know, living in Hollywood, like I have tons of filmmaker friends that I don't necessarily love all their movies, but I don't judge them based on what their movies are like. I judge them based on who they are as people, you know? And for me, yep. like that's ultimately what I like. And I think I I've been kind of uh, in tune with that since the very beginning, because even, even as a young filmmaker, before I ever even touched a camera for the first time, I was watching behind the scenes on DVDs and things like that because I, I wanted to know who these filmmakers were. And sometimes I wouldn't really like a movie and, but I would watch the behind the scenes or I would listen to the commentary and I would fall in love with the filmmaker because of their passion and their enthusiasm. And it would make me respect the movie that much more. So it's like, I, I am a firm believer in, you know, you can judge the art based on its own merit and that's totally fine. Like that's what art is about. But I do believe that art uh, in general is is a bigger medium and it's not just about what it is. It's about the stories behind it. It's about the people who make it and and everything that goes into it. It's not just this one, you know, nebulous thing. Right. Do you guys film like behind the scenes footage and stuff like that to, to be oh, released? Totally. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I try to do that on every film. Uh, some movies we've had more footage than others, like on, on Get the Girl. I think we had a guy there. My, my latest film, Get the Girl, I think we had a guy there like, you know, almost every day. And then on Contracted, we didn't have the money to, to do it. So we basically just had, you know, my producer, uh, Matt Mercer, was doing it whenever he could. Um, and it's funny because Matt Mercer actually, you know, he was an actor in Madison County uh, and he filmed some little behind the scenes stuff uh, that I think is on YouTube now. But, you know, he, he did his own little behind the scenes documentary uh, just as an actor from his perspective. So it's always cool, especially now with cell phones and cameras so accessible. It's like actors can kind of make their own little documentaries and things like that about their experiences on set. And, you know, the, the more I make movies, the more I'm going to try and do my own kind of director perspective. And, you know, hopefully one day it'll get as detailed as, you know, maybe someone following me around with a camera. Cause you know, that's the type of stuff that I really enjoyed as a young filmmaker. And, and, you know, I, I wanted to see as much as possible. It's like how, how the life is of a, of a working filmmaker from day to day. And that's, you know, that, that's a fascinating lifestyle because it's, it's so up and down and, there's so many challenges, and I think as a young filmmaker, the best thing you can do is be prepared for it. All right. I'm going to put you on the spot here for a second. Yeah. What What would you say is uh, – because I'm, I'm totally in agreement with you about like commentaries and stuff like that. What is – what are your, like, your favorite DVD commentaries that you've ever – Heard. Um, I don't know if I have too many like commentaries, <laughs> um, because, uh, or or behind the scenes or whatever. Yeah, b behind the scenes, I have a ton. Um, I actually really, really like um the four hour documentary on Rob Zombie's Halloween. Have you ever seen that? No, I that's one of the few I haven't seen. Yeah, damn it, man. It's it's in, it's incredible <laughs> because and and this isn't necessarily based on like I, I don't I don't absolutely love that movie, but yeah. I love how in depth the the documentary is like it literally starts from him in pre-production like it shows him doing camera tests it shows him doing acting you know auditions it shows him like it shows the wardrobe person bringing him different options and him doing sketches and location scouts all the way up until like the last day of filming and it's literally four like four and a half hours long and and it's wow. like just one of the most immersive you know detailed raw experiences i've ever seen captured uh you know in a behind the scenes and um i'm trying to think of some other good ones there's a few that that stand out really heavily um that that's always kind of one of my big go-to's um just because right. of how thorough it is um i i really enjoyed um you know eli roth's uh hostel he he did a pretty detailed one on hostel and cabin fever um I'm trying to think uh Gosh, I'd have to go through and like look at my DVD collection. But the, you know, whenever someone asks me about it, usually Rob Zombie's Halloween. Oh, Devil's Rejects. His one for Devil's Rejects was really good too. Have you seen that one? 
No. Oh, I've yeah. seen the movie. I haven't seen the behind the scenes. Yeah, it's like a two two hour documentary on the making of uh, Devil's Rejects, and you know, right. it's once again, it's everything from like table reads to. Um, you know, I think even all the way into editing. So, you know, right. for me, it's like as much as you can get, you know, in, in the, in the nitty gritty process of it all, that's, that's the stuff that excites me. Right. Have you seen Lost in La Mancha? Uh, yes, I love it. <laughs> that's cool I did an interview the other day with a producer and he was like, you know, I don't get that documentary because, you know, you see all the stuff that goes wrong on that set. That goes wrong on every set. It's like that's every film, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's like just get used to to everything going wrong, and uh, you know, I, he's like, I don't know why the film never got made because that that wouldn't have kept anybody from, you know, stopping. Anyway, uh, moving along. Um, so after uh, Madison County, um, what happened from there? Let's follow the story. Um, after Madison County, within uh, within we shot the movie in October 2010 or, or September to October 2010. By March 2011, we had um, our trailer released, and we had our trailer cut probably before the end of the year of uh, 2010. So we started showing early cuts of the trailer um, almost immediately. And so we had people asking us, what are you doing next? Are you doing a sequel to Madison County? And this was before the movie was even finished. So people were already considering it a success, um, which was nice and very uh, presumptuous of them. <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, very premature. But, um, you know, people were like, hey, what do you want to do next? And I knew immediately I didn't want to do another, like, straightforward horror movie, kind of like uh, Madison County. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I started writing this screenplay called Roadside and, um, we actually started shooting, we, you know, we finished Madison County shooting wise, uh, October, 2010 and, um, March, 2011, we were flying to Virginia to shoot Roadside. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we found private investors again, um, you know, who, who wanted to get into the movie business and, um, you know, we, we convinced them to, uh, give us the financing based on, you know, all the news articles and all the press and success that we had had with Madison County, we showed them, we said, look, like we already had people offering to buy the movie. And, you know, it's like, we're, we're, we're pretty confident that we're going to at least make our money back, if not see a decent profit on Madison County. So we kind of parlayed that into roadside and, um, roadside was probably the messiest production of my life because it, you know, we were just so, uh, on cloud nine for Madison County that I think we really, underestimated the process of roadside because it was essentially, you know, a very contained Hitchcockian thriller. And, um, you know, we, we shot the movie entirely at nighttime where Madison County was entirely at day. Like we just wanted to do something really, really different. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we kind of didn't realize that we were still learning and we kind of had this mentality of like, Oh, we've done this before. So we weren't prepared for the new challenges that laid in front of us. And that was the first time, you know, it clicked to me. I'm like, shit, going out to make a movie, it's, it's, it's brand new every time you do it, you know? So, um, so that, that production was a nightmare. We, we were under scheduled, under, understaffed, under financed. So it was just a big, big hurdle. It was the worst shoot of my life. I, I still, you know, I probably lost hair on that shoot. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, 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 it was just the biggest pain in the ass. And I remember flying home, uh, just relieved that it was over and nervous as hell that we didn't make a good movie. Um, and, and, you know, thankfully when we got into the editing room, like, you know, we, we had most of the pieces that we needed. Like I, I didn't, I didn't get to direct the movie the way I wanted to. And I, I regret that immensely, but, um, but I, I think it was one of those things where it's like, I, there's really not much I can do once again, e even more so like this was another one just struggling to keep our head above water. But, it was it was worse because we were just underprepared, you know, like we, uh -huh. we kind of were like, OK, we did really well in Madison County. We had, you know, 20 locations. We had 30 characters. And with Roadside, we're going to have three locations and five characters. We This is going to be a walk in the park. And it absolutely wasn't, you know, so it, it was just kind of, a, you know, we, we, we were defeated before we went in. But thankfully, we still pulled out a very, very competent film. Uh -huh. Now you had said something about doing that before. I mean, getting starting to shoot that before Madison County had even really gone into distribution, right? Uh, yeah, Madison County actually hadn't even finished post production, so um, our editor was actually still working on editing Madison County while we were filming uh, Roadside. So did it end up having the success that you thought it was going to have? Did Madison County? Yeah. 
Um, I don't think I don't think it had I, I think it had a better success than than what it should have, and I think um, I, I don't think it reached our expectations, but our expectations were extremely high. Um, but I mean, we, you know, we, we, you know, my first movie right out of the gate premiered at the the Chinese theater uh, at, at one of the biggest genre festivals in North America, actually the biggest genre festival in North America. And, um, and, you know, and, and I was in there with like, you know, Ty West had a movie there that year. And, um, you know, it was just a huge, huge turnout. We, we were the only movie to sell out. Um, they, they gave us an encore screening. We got distribution. The movie came out in May of 2012. Um, and, and it was, it was decently received. Like it, it didn't, it didn't, you know, critics didn't, you know, you know, praise it and they didn't hate it. It was just very middle of the road. But, um, you know, but it, it, I think the movie ended up having a success of its own, which was, uh, you know, good enough for us. Like it was our, our first foot in the door. Right. The, the distribution, uh, sorry, I get a lot into the nuts and bolts. So forgive yeah, me. No, no. <laughs> the distribution deal that you made was that um, what what kind of a contract was that? Or I mean, not just what was that for? Like for world distribution? Was it for DVDs? How how did that all come together? Was there any sort of like talk of video on demand or you know things like iTunes and Vudu and stuff like that? Or, or just to give us a, a little bit of a inside look into that part. Yeah, for sure. It was um, it was a pretty straightforward contract. Like we we had people approach us about doing a limited theatrical run, um, but their minimum guarantees, which are the money they're going to pay for the movie up front, uh, weren't as high. So we ended up going with a company that had a, a little bit of a bigger reputation than some of the others, and and you know had movies that we had seen on shelves in Walmart and things like that. So um, we we took that deal. It was a it was a straight to DVD uh, contract. So the movie went into Redbox and things like that. Uh, the company wasn't really a VOD focused company. They, this was still like the last year that physical media was still pretty relevant. Um, but um, but you know, so the movie went to to Walmart and and got released on DVD and actually made most of its money on DVD if I remember correctly. But um, but yeah, so I mean, the the contract was pretty straightforward. Nothing nothing fancy in terms of. Uh, promotion or release or anything like that it was it was very standard and we got the movie on shelves and we got uh, a really solid amount of exposure into the marketplace so mm-hmm. you know we, we we were happy with that we were happy that people could go to stores and buy our movie and and that uh you know that that kind of gave us a, a a pretty good chunk of legitimacy so who owns the movie though that's the question i always have like if you the distribution company has the right to distribute it for for how long uh, I want to say it was like 15 years. Okay. And then after that, you retain the owner, like the producers retain the ownership? Uh, the, that... Yeah, the, the producer retains the ownership. I, I actually own the property, so I, I can do sequels and stuff. No one else can do sequels um, or okay. remake or anything like that. But um, that one movie is owned by the producer and the, the distributor owns the rights to exploit it for, yeah, I believe up to like 15 years. So you get retain the rights because you have the copyright from the script or how is that? How do you do that? Um, I, I basically put it in into my deal, like because it was such a low budget film, and and I I literally took no money, like not not just like oh a couple pennies here and there, like I literally took nothing to direct the film. <laughs> right. um, so so I, I basically was like, look, you know, if we're gonna make this movie, I I want to own the the quote unquote franchise potential of it. So like, if someone wants to make a sequel, I'll get paid for that one. Um, you know, so, so that, that was kind of the idea was like, if, if someone ever wants to come along and remake it or do a sequel or something like that, like I I will, I will own that because I created the first one. Um, but the producer actually owns that, that particular film. So, you know, he, if, if he wants to re-release it after 15 years, or if he wants to license it to someone else, or, you know, if someone comes along and they're like, we want to, you know, do a retro screening or something like that, like they have to go to him. Okay. So you can can you do action figures? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can. <laughs> okay, that's the big one, you know. Just yeah. learn from George Lucas. Always, always keep the action figure rights. You know. Yeah, totally. Um, so okay, moving on from there, uh, from Roadside, were, the next film was contracted, or was there something between there? Uh, it was contracted. Yeah. Okay, so that's I, I want to focus on that for um, a bit. Uh, can you talk about how that came about, and and you know. Where the screenplay came from, how how producers got involved, just how it all kind of comes together. 
Totally. Yeah. I, it was, uh, you know, I, I, I was kind of frustrated with the, the whole business side of everything because like with Madison County, the movie was exploited. It's kind of like a slasher movie. And you know, the, the idea of the film wasn't really to do it as a slasher movie. Like I tried to do something that was a little different. And, um, so, you know, but they kept focusing on the serial killer in the movie because it was kind of this iconic imagery that they were able to mass exploit and just grab people's attention, which I, you know, I knew nothing about how they marketed films in that way. So you know, it was a very eye-opening and learning experience. And then when we went to do Roadside, Roadside's this very tense, story-driven character movie. And there was no, you know, iconic imagery in the film that could really sell the movie. No serial killer, no, you know, nothing for them to exploit, essentially. No famous actors. So we were having trouble selling Roadside because everyone was like, look, we like your movie, but that we don't know how to sell it. And so... um fed up with that i was like okay you know what i really i really want to do a movie that it's just totally hits the point for the market maybe this will get into a festival because like up until that point you know we got rejected from almost every festival uh with the first two movies and so i was like you know i'm gonna really aim high for festivals and markets and just try to do something really really different again but something that felt more in line with the stuff that i saw having success in the genre and um, and and so and also uh, something that's really important to point out is like with Madison County and Roadside, I was making movies because I could, you know, like people were saying, hey, we have money. What do you what do you want to make that works in this world? And I wasn't telling stories that I, I necessarily felt needed to be told. So like, you know, we shot at my grandpa's farm for Madison County because I had an idea that based around his farm. And then with Roadside, you know, I had an idea because I knew we could shoot the movie because we could get a car and we could do this. So it was like kind of like what can we make with what we have? You know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. with with Contracted, it was the first time I'd ever written a story not thinking about like, OK, I know this is the one element that I can exploit um, and I'll write a story around it, you know. So right. I wrote I wrote the movie just based on, you know, the 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 initial idea, which was, you know, a girl has a one night stand and contracts what she thinks is an STD. And so, you know, I was like, that's a really cool idea. I should write that story. So I I kind of, you know, plotted out the story and I initially wanted to shoot it overseas because I wanted it to happen in a country where, um, you know, where she, the girl didn't speak the language and didn't, um, you know, just had trouble realizing everything. Um uh, that was happening to her. So what happened was the producers, uh, came to me and said, Hey, you know, we, we want to make a movie. This was their first film. And they were like, we have financing. We can green light it immediately, but we just need to find someone who can make a movie and make something good. And they, they had heard of Madison County. They had seen it. I think they even went to the, the premiere. I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, I showed them roadside and they loved it. They were like, wow, this is really, really good. So they, they saw that I had versatility um, and, and they, they greenlit the movie right there just on a handshake. Like I had no script, no anything. I was just like, look, you guys are going to, you know, write a check. And, and it was my smallest movie to date. Um, it was, uh, you know, they had $50,000 and I think we ended up spending like 45 to, to, you know, make the entire film. So, um, so, you know, it, it was kind of like, I, I used it as almost once again, kind of an experiment to kind of go back to my, my grassroots style of filmmaking. But, uh, I was going to change one crucial thing, and that was I wasn't going to write a story just because I had elements in place already. I was just going to write the story based on what I thought the story should be and then um, and, and then figure out how to execute it based on the elements I had. So it was it was, it was a completely new style of filmmaking for me, um, and, and, you know, it, thankfully it worked out. It was mostly handheld, right? Uh, yeah, the, the whole movie's handheld except for like right. maybe two or three shots. Okay. Does that change how you approach it? I mean, since you're not thinking in terms of, you know, a camera is like slowly doing a, a pan or, or, you know, do you just film it more kind of guerrilla style, documentary style? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, Madison County was very handheld, but with Contracted, I think it was the first time I approached, I'd approached the movie with kind of the aesthetic in mind for the character with, with Madison County, I approached it like, okay, these other movies did handheld. I should do handheld. Um, or the, uh, these other movies did a dolly here. I'll do a dolly here, you know? So mm -hmm. 
uh, with Contracted, it was the first time I was like, you know, I wanted the movie to feel intimate because the character story was so intimate. So I was, it was really one of the first times I was thinking like, okay, what should I do as a director? Like in, in a lot of ways, I consider Contracted my first real movie because it was the first time I, I started thinking like a filmmaker and thought story first instead of, okay, what, what do I need to do to make sure I don't mess this up? <laughs> you know, uh, so I, it, you know, my first two movies, I was thinking very heavily as a producer. Um, and so, so with contracted, yeah, I, I, I approached everything from a, from an emotional or, and, or a na- uh, narrative standpoint. So, you know, and, and the, the handheld, uh, aesthetic was based on the story and, and both of those were based on the budget. So I kind of reverse engineered it knowing that, you know, I didn't need any big crane shots or dolly shots or anything like that, because I was going to tell a very intimate story that didn't need a lot of fancy, you know, fancy bells and whistles. Right. Can you talk a little bit about your process for screenwriting? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, my, I, I, you know, I, I don't consider myself that great of a writer, so I always hate talking about it. But um, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, actually, I, a I, lot of the people that I talk to say the you know filmmakers who have made really good movies that you know will always tell you, oh, but I'm not a writer, you know. But it's like, well, you know, <laughs> you might not be comfortable with it, but screenwriting is a lot more about you know, telling a visual story than it is about being necessarily the greatest writer in the world. But if you can tell your story visually, you know, it, it goes a lot further. Totally. And I mean, you know, it, it's, it's weird for me to talk about writing because like, I've, I never, like I said, I don't consider myself much of a writer. Um, I write by necessity. Like I, I write because I need things to direct. Um, so, you know, when, when I write a screenplay, I know that I'm not writing it for like, um, you know, a studio head or something like that. Like I've never, ri- I've never entered into a competition or anything like that. So I write my screenplays, you know, my, my screen, my screenplays read like any other screenplay. Like I, 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 my formula and my, my structure and everything like that is, is, you know, very traditional, but, um, but it's like my, my screenplays are, you know, essentially what, what they're supposed to be. They're, they're blueprints for, for my, my movie, you know? So it's like, I, I don't necessarily write in shots. Like I, I have some friends who are very just director, driven you know and they write like a director um i i don't necessarily write like a director but you know i i definitely i write very simply like I, i'm a very efficient writer so i i what i do my my process for lack of better terms is like i, I let the story kind of marinate in my head for you know a, a few days or a week or however long it takes um sometimes it takes months sometimes it takes weeks sometimes it takes a year um it really just depends on how well i grasp that story and that concept and then eventually it kind of reaches a boiling point where, you know, I don't write down, you know, I'll write down like the initial ideas so I don't forget it. Um, and then I'll just kind of let it stew. Like I don't really write much after that. Like I'll just kind of keep this little notepad or journal and I'll, I'll keep that log line or that idea or the chicken scratch, you know, I wrote down to, to begin it with. And then eventually the, the, all the ideas I have just kind of boil over and I start writing them down in like almost bullet point form. And they're not always necessarily in, in chronological order. So it's just kind of the thoughts that generate in my head. Sometimes they're scene ideas. Sometimes they are dialogue. Sometimes they're characters. Sometimes they're, you know, whatever. Um, and then I, I kind of just do that for, you know, however long it takes. Usually it's like a few days or a week. And then eventually I feel like I have a good enough grasp on the story and I'll start writing. So like, you know, I wrote contracted in like three weeks, the first draft. So, you know, it's like I, I knew the story really well. I kind of marinated on it really quickly. And, you know, I, I get really excited when I know, like, I don't, I don't have a lot of, you know, spec screenplays that I've written laying around. Um, Mm -hmm. if I, if I have any spec screenplays, uh, laying around, it's because I wrote a script for a movie that just ultimately, the financing fell through, you know, cause like I've never written a screenplay and said, Hey, here's, you know, except for Madison County, really. Um, you know, that was the first time I ever said, Hey, I have this script. Um, but every other time roadside contracted, even, even my, my newest film, get the girl. It's like, I, I have the producers commit to the movie and say, yeah, we're going to, you know, they almost pay me to write the script because I know we're going to make the movie. Like I want to know that this movie is getting made or else there's no point in me writing a script in my opinion. Um, especially at a low budget level because things change so much. So, you know, if I write a script, um, you know, for one producer at a certain budget level and 
let's say the movie doesn't get financed and then that script's just sitting there and another producer comes along, it's like the circumstances may have changed and then I have to go back and rewrite, restructure and do all that stuff. So it's like I, I'd rather just wait until the movie's ready to be made, you know. So that's just my my personal mentality. But um, up until recently, like just, just this year actually, um, I wrote my first uh, – you know, I, I got hired to write a screenplay – um, you know, that I'm ultimately going to direct, but it was the first time that, you know, uh, it, it was going to bigger producers and studios and, um, you know, things like that. So that, that was kind of a new process for me, but, you know, I treated the process, um, the exact same way as I, I did with all my other ones. Like the producers came to me, I pitched them an idea, they liked it and they said, yeah, we're going to pay you to write it. And I wrote it and, uh, you know, I marinated on it and it, it, it took me like, uh, I want to say maybe, maybe a month, month and a half to finish the entire screenplay. And, and, you know, we went through, I want to say maybe five drafts or something like that and, you know, sent it off for feedback and the feedback's coming back great. So, you know, I, I'm getting a little more confident in my writing, but yeah, it's, it's like my, my process is very much, uh, you know, just what, what works for me. Cause I don't know how to do it any other way, you know? All right. Are there any, um, where, where did you learn screenwriting? Is there any resource that you can point people to? Um, I don't know how I learned. I actually, I learned, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying is it's kind I of bumped like my head a, one day and I was, right. yeah, it's kind of a learn by <laughs> learn trial by error kind of thing. Like, did I you read like, a lot of screenplays when you were in film school? I did. That's actually what I was about to say is I've, uh, okay. I, I've actually read a lot of screenplays. Um, and I, I actually had a screenwriting teacher who, who's written some books on, you know, screenwriting and she, she, she you know, she, she's had some success in coaching screenwriters and things like that. And she actually gave me the biggest biggest piece of advice I'd ever gotten and, and it still resonates with me to this day but we were in class one day and pitching ideas and learning learning to take notes and learning to get criticism and learning to develop ideas and I would always throw out the most bizarre ideas in her classroom and she would tell me she would say you're a brilliant screenwriter but you don't know why <laughs> and I, I didn't I didn't know um, I didn't know what that meant but now I now that I've kind of come to terms and kind of come into my own as a filmmaker, I, I finally get what she means. And, and she meant that I have a very unique voice. I have a very unique perspective on the world. And I tell, you know, pretty unique stories, um, especially now, now after contracted, but, you know, I, I tell unique stories, but for the longest time, I didn't know why I told them. And I didn't know why I wanted to tell them. I just, I wanted, uh, I wanted to get them out. And finally, I've kind of learned the discipline that I lacked when she first told me that. And I think it's really been uh you know a, a very helpful thing to me but you know th those words really stuck with me because it, it at least validated me to know that i had something inherently you know positive about my work and i had a natural ability or talent or whatever you want to call it but i just needed to learn how to harness it and i think I've, i finally you know reached that point so thank you to her you don't remember her name uh Lin yeah no i do Lin <laughs> linda Calgo. i just didn't know she okay. was out there uh, okay. No, yeah. I'm sure that that uh, that praise would be uh, something she would, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I, ironically, like, a, a fun I mean, if you if you want to talk, you know, smack about a teacher, they're probably not going to want. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> uh, no, she she was great. She, she you know, it's funny because, like I said, I, I didn't really fancy myself a screenwriter, but I loved my screenwriting teachers um, in film school, and she was one of my favorites. And and ironically, it kind of came full circle while I was filming Get the Girl. Um, we were shooting at the parking garage in my old film school because I needed a parking garage, and she actually came and visited me on set. Uh, you know, she was like, "I heard," she was like, "I heard someone was shooting a movie here," and she was like, "And then someone told me it was you," and I just had to come by and say hello. So it was really kind of cool for uh, you know my old screenwriting teacher to come see me on the set of my my latest movie. Um, you know, it was really really cool. Yeah. Okay, so walk us through uh, the the process making uh, contracted. If you can give us a little bit of. Uh you know, a behind the scenes of how, how that was working with your actors. And, and, you know, one thing that's interesting to me is knowing kind of in a 24 hour period, um, what is that like? Okay. You wake up, you, you have maybe some coffee, <laughs> you know, you go to the set. What, what are you doing while you're filming? I mean, are you just like constantly 24 hours a day focused on, I mean, are you generating new ideas, thinking about how you're going to shoot the scene the next day? What, what is the mindset that you're in while you're shooting? And how, how long did that, sorry, how long was the shoot, by the way? Uh, contracted was shot in 15 days, so three five day weeks. Um, okay. The process actually contracted was probably the smoothest shoot I've ever had, and I think it was um, simply because we didn't have a lot, and we knew we didn't have a lot, so 
there was really nothing to stress about. You know, it's like we, we planned very efficiently. It was my third feature film. So I was really, really well prepared for what the challenges were going to be. We shot in Los Angeles. Um, we used a lot of people's locations that we knew we could get for free. So people's apartments, people's houses, things like that. Um, you know, a lot of my friends are in the movie. So contracted once again, was kind of going back to like my backyard roots. Like it felt very much like a home movie. Um, but just with a bigger, bigger story, you know, like whereas Madison County and roadside were backyard movies, you know, filmed in the backyard with like very humble roots and kind of like, you know, we, we treated those movies with baby hands. Um, because like, we didn't really know what we were doing and we were making movies because like, Oh, my parents can get a car. My grandpa has a farm. Like we just, we we're making movies around the elements we had with contracted. We treated it like a real movie. It's like, okay, let's, let's go for broke here. You know, like let's really go for it. And so, um, you know, I think that mentality changed everything. It made us really strive to make something unique, original and different and exciting. And, um, you know, every day was kind of, uh, kind of a, a challenge because, you know, uh, my lead actress was in makeup almost every day. Um, we didn't have a lot of time to shoot. Um, we didn't have, you know, a, 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 you know, our, our actors were extremely great. The casting process was phenomenal. So we had great actors. Um, every, it, it just felt like a family. Like my lead actress and I really clicked. Uh, you know, my other co-stars and I really clicked. A lot of them were my friends. Um, and a lot of the crew, you know, I, thankfully I was able to kind of cherry pick the great crew members from Madison County and Roadside to come along with me to film Contracted. And that shorthand really helps a lot. Like my, you know, my, my sound guy knows where I'm going to shoot the shot. So he knows where, you know, where he should put the microphones and, you know, mm -hmm. it just, it, it really, really helped. So it was a great, great shoot and really smooth. And, um, you know, every day was just kind of like, you know, I, I show up to set with, with my shot ideas, my shot list. And then I see, you know, the, the, the scariest thing about shooting low budget films is sometimes you show up on set and you're seeing location for the first time. So like, you know, I had ideas of shots that I wanted to do, but I didn't know if they were, if they were possible. So, you know, especially when you're shooting handheld, you can really adapt to your scene. You can really adapt to what your actors are going to do. You can adapt to your environment. So it, it made it really flexible, which I think really helped the film. And, and we kind of approached the entire movie. Like we had a great plan, but we were very adaptable. So you hadn't seen some of the locations before? You didn't do like a location scout for each place that you shot or, or uh, how did we, that work? We did for the, the key locations, like the, oh. the actual, the house party at the very beginning of the film and the end, like Alice's house was that actress's house, Alice. Like, so I wrote the role <laughs> for her. I mean, I'm, I'm not joking when I say it was a backyard movie. Um, you know, right. I, I wrote the role for her. I knew she had a house. I knew she'd let us use it. Um, and you know, I'd been to her house a million times and then, um, you know, the, the cafe and the bars that we shot at were places that my girlfriend worked at, uh, you know, or the lead actor worked at and I'd been to a million times and, um, you know, so it was just writing around things we knew we could get, um, that, that also worked for the story. We weren't forcing them into the movie, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, uh, but places like, uh, you know, the doctor's office I'd never seen, uh, before the, uh, okay. The, the morgue, you know, was shot on a soundstage. I'd never been to that place before. Um, trying to think if there are any others. Um, I think that was actually it. But, um, but yeah, a, a lot of those places I had never seen before. Now, the makeup for the movie was incredible. Did you have you. to – did you uh – I assume you didn't shoot everything kind of in the correct order. I mean, would you shoot one location and do, you know, the makeup, how she was normal, then the gradual change every time you would shoot that location? Or did you try to shoot relatively in order? Um, we tried, we, we, that, that was kind of the nightmare of the, the shoot was the makeup because like we shot based on location. So like we spent the first week of shooting at the house location, um, mm -hmm. for, for her and her mother. So like, you know, at the beginning of the movie, she's fine. And then towards the end of the film, she's like rotting away. So like we would have to shoot certain, you know, makeup scenes in progression and then go back. So like the, uh, the very last scene in the movie with the car crash, uh, actually takes place in front of the location where she goes to buy drugs, like midway through the movie. So we actually had to shoot the ending of the film at the beginning of the day and then take off the makeup and then reapply it. Um, to shoot a scene in the middle of the movie. So like that, that was kind of, we shot based on location. So mm -hmm. okay. that, that kind of, you know, forced our hand in which makeup scenarios were which, but you know, and that, that was kind of a pain in the ass just because it took so long and we had a very, you know, minimal makeup crew cause we just didn't have a lot of money. So 
you know, we, we were really kind of tied down to the makeup schedule, unfortunately, but we were able to kind of shoot around it or make it work. And, you know, uh, my makeup artist and I, I, I was really involved with the makeup. Like I, I was very detailed in the screenplay and, um, we broke it down into three phases. We said, okay, this is phase one, this is phase two, and this is phase three. So we, we were able to kind of have a little bit of a shorthand knowing where she needed to be with her makeup and kind of, you know, okay, this came after that. We kept really good continuity photos. So we kind of knew what she looked like and things like that. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, it, it was pretty regimented. Yeah. The thing with the eyes, I think was the thing that really kind of was, just like shocking to me, you know, because like she would walk around with her glasses on and then people would want to see her eyes and, and that just kind of, you know, just having the red eye, it's just yeah. so freaky to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, once again, one of those simple, simple tricks, it becomes really effective. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we, I've been talking a lot with other filmmakers about, um, kind of body horror and, um, the, the concept of having a story that's, kind of got one foot in reality and one foot in, um, you know, fiction, um, which is that there is something very real about what she's going through. You know, it's like yeah. you, you identify with, okay, it's like she's deteriorating and there's some like kind of horrific science fiction side of that. But at the same time, it's told within the context of this is a real, you know, th- this kind of connects with something that people deal with in real life, you know? Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> like i mean i was talking to uh adam robitel the other day and uh he did uh, the taking of deborah logan yeah i know i know adam great guy yeah and so it was like the the thing that i think connects and and they connect in similar ways you know which is that you connect with the the lead character immediately because it it's based you know on something that's real but it's also you know horror you know it's also like the science science fiction side of it yeah, totally. I, I like to call it like relatable, uh, relatable horror, you know, and it's like it's something that's really <laughs> fascinating to me because right. like, you know, you, you can take like, you, you know, it's something as simple as like Halloween, you know, it's it's so relatable because who hasn't, you know, had a babysitter or known a babysitter or been a babysitter, you know, it's like that's that's something that really resonates to a lot of people. And then, you know, you see something like the strangers. It's like who hasn't been home alone at night and someone knocks on the door and you don't know who they are or you haven't heard a creaky noise outside, you know, it's like the those are all relatable feelings and scenarios. And then, you know, but something like, you know, you watch something like the thing or the fly, which are both body horror films. Um, you know, it's like not many people have been trapped inside of a, you know, a a machine that turns you into something or tries to teleport you or, you know, not many people have been stuck in like, you know, an Antarctic environment with a creature, you know, but it's like they find ways to get inside your fears and things like that. And it's like, for me, I think, we're just kind of taking a, a more relatable approach instead of like trying to take a narrative that's not familiar and make people identify with it. Uh, we're taking something that's very familiar to them and, and kind of using that as a shorthand to get our, our point across that much quicker. Because I think, you know, today's audiences check out really quickly if they don't relate to the characters right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that impressed me the most is just the, the restraint, you know, you let it build and it, it does happen very gradually, you know, so that you, you really get to know this character, but it's like slowly things start, you know, is there some way that you kind of like pace that out or like could feel what was the right moment for, for things to, to happen? I mean, do you, do you go through your structure and, and say, okay, uh, I mean, something like save the cat or the hero's journey, stuff like that. Do you go through your story and say, okay, this is going to be when this happens and then we need to have this happen by this moment and, and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. That's a big part of my process, but I don't know if I, I, I follow like traditional structure, like save the cat. Like I've read the book. Um, but it's like, I, I haven't touched it in years. I really, it's more of a gut. <laughs> it's more of a gut thing. You know, it's right. like, I, I kind of think like, what does the audience want at this point? What am I trying to tell them? Where's my character's journey at this point? It's like, Really, it's it's just a matter of, um, in my opinion, I, I'm a big fan of ambiguity, and I'm a big fan of, um, you know, doling out enough information to keep the audience uh, invested, but not enough to where they know everything and they they can figure it out. So it's like, for me, I I want to keep them uh, kind of on the hook, and if I have them on the hook, I can I can pull them up and down whenever I want. And that's kind of the idea. It was like, you know, mid. I, I think some of the biggest 